G'day wankers, welcome to another Guitar Wank podcast. I am your host, Troy McCubbin. Thank you for joining us for episode 215. What are we, July 1st, 2020, baby. And, uh, yeah, shit has hit the fan. It, uh, I guess, <laughs> wow, man, we are really going through it in 2020. This is uh, bad times for a lot of people, for all. This is just shit and annoying and um yeah what do you what can you do it's it's a hunker down stay safe wear a fucking mask and um and just hang tough i guess don't let the bastards get you down this virus sucks really really sucks for all this is just bad and i know some people out there are going through some just devastating times and man no words i i just don't even know what to say it's just fucking hard so um yeah hang in there hang in there but um we're gonna soldier on with episode 215 with mr pete bernstein do you know pete pete is a new york cat and uh we had the pleasure of zooming with pete (laughs) nah i'm not showing the video because uh (laughs) it's it's boring as shit watching the video just all oh, three three four three four faces just staring at screens really i i i feel there's no need to do that to you it's bad enough that we're giving you guitar wank so we will not do that but anyway it was, it was a fun hang with pete and uh great player check his stuff out we're actually going to listen to a track of pete's in a second this is called Let's cool one. I would assume he would mean let's cool a beer and have a drink. That's where my head would go with this track, Pete. So I'm excited to listen to it. But uh, yeah, Pete Bernstein, we're going to learn all about Pete. Uh, We have uh, another few cats coming up in the next few weeks. Dave Stryker, I think, is uh, one of our next episodes, so that'll be fun. So um, yeah, lots of fun. Trying to keep it light. In these heavy times, people, keep it light. Um, so anyway, uh, if you ha- don't know this already and you're under a rock, <laughs> uh, go to guitarwank.com. We've got a new website and we'd love you to sign up, join it, be a part of the gang. Uh, once we're done with all this coronavirus shit, we're going to get everyone together and just have a big party. Um, yeah, or go on a big bike ride or I don't know do something but uh go to guitarwank.com you can donate if you feel compelled because that keeps this show running on the (laughs) on the oily rags it runs on now uh you can also go to patreon.com slash guitarwank there's a link on guitarwank.com you can sign up and get the amazing bruce foreman one minute videos which are superior to everything else out there it was really awesome i gotta say i'm i'm such a fan of these videos because you get one minute 60 seconds baby and you learn something and you walk away with something to work on you aren't confused it's it's just great advice in 60 seconds so definitely worth it and uh patreon's super cheap and it just supports the guitar whack wank wank team (laughs) And uh, and keeps the show running at the the Grand Prix abilities it has. <laughs> number two in the guitar guitar uh, podcast world. Number number two, only sec only second to a guitar w- podcast that doesn't even exist anymore. That's how popular we are, people. So thank you for all your support. So go to guitarwank.com. We've got donations, Patreon. We're getting the store organized. We're getting a new store, new merch, new everything. Be able to get Guitar Wank knickers. I think that'd be actually cool, actually. Guitar Wank knickers and bikinis. That'll be a big hit with the kids. Um, Yeah, but anyway, it's all good. Uh, That's about it. Scott and Bruce uh, staying indoors teaching doing videos remember to catch bruce live at five baby five o'clock today wednesday july 1st five o'clock today go to bruce foreman uh youtube channel or on facebook and uh you can watch him and his lovely wife gidget which is uh that's her stage name 
and you can check out the antics and them and some great playing as always from Bruce go check that out what else we got got so much wealth of information to give you guys we've got enough I think we have one more episode of Eric Singer from Kiss the drummer from Kiss uh, so I've got to get that one up so yeah so hang in uh, a big shout out to my mate Ulf Ulf in Sweden <laughs> hey going Ulf hey Ulf just told me he had the coronavirus like back in I think February somewhere March February he had it back then. I remember talking to him and he's like, man, I'm really sick at the moment. I feel like shit. This is a bad one. I don't know what it is. And then he got test results the other day and yep, coronavirus, baby. He got through it. So uh, maybe we can set Ulf up to give some blood to uh, Guitar Wank and we can sell it to our listeners and that'll be our, um, yeah, our uh, antibodies for the coronavirus. Ulf antibodies from Guitar Wank, sponsored by Guitar Wank. I think it's a great idea. We'll do it. We'll just uh, ship your blood out, Ulf, in uh, little plastic vials, ice them up, and there we go. Ulf, Swedish blood that will get you through the coronavirus. I love it. Fucking brilliant. I'm going to jump on that as soon as I finish this intro. All right, let's get into this podcast. Ah, the shit is flowing freely today, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's get into it. This is uh, Let's Cool One with Pete Bernstein Trio, I believe. I think it is. And uh, and then we'll talk to Pete in New York. So um, stay safe. Stay mentally safe. Stay healthy. Try and laugh every day if you can. And um, and let's, let's all get through this bullshit together so we can continue to wank on. All right, guys, we'll see you uh, all next episode. Thank you, and uh, out.
Invisible, but I'm here. <laughs> oh, good. Hi, Just, man. G'day, Pete. My, I'm Troy. Hey, Troy, how you doing? All good, right. man. Good. Scott, Scott. Here, maybe I can. Am I too dark? Scott doesn't like to be on video because he's usually in drag or in uh, his underwear. Well, I'm usually in drag, but today I'm I'm not in drag, but I am in my underwear. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pete, there where you go. where are you coming in from? I'm I'm in New York City. I'm in my uh, my very kind uh, neighbor's studio apartment in the building where I live, a few floors up, where I don't have any place to like set up to play or do any kind of online stuff. So my neighbor's out of town indefinitely, so I can use his place. Little apartment here. I keep my guitar here and. But that's it. I'm in New York City, the West Village. Oh, uh -huh. wow. Nice. So you, and we were just talking to Steve Cardenas the, the, on our last podcast. Do you guys know each other? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Yeah. You know, we used to play together a lot when he lived out here in L.A. Oh, right. And we missed him. Right. You know, he abandoned us. <laughs> right. He's originally from uh, Kansas, Kansas City. Kansas right? City, yeah. And, and then he lived in the Bay Area for a while. So Bruce knew him from the Bay Area. Right. And um and he was in LA for I don't know maybe three four years. Actually, then... I I knew him when he was when he was just a kid in Kansas City. He was my apprentice oh. at at a Jamie Ampersold camp one summer. Wow. Damn. So that, I mean, he's the eighties, early early eighties. With yeah, must have been that. Yeah. Wow. So Pete, cool. how do you know how do you know Bruce and Scott? Uh, I've actually never met Scott. Never oh, met you're a lucky Peter. man. <laughs> I just know I just know you, uh, the sound. Big, big fan. And, Troy's uh, a big I fan of mine, you can tell. <laughs> he, well, he lets you wear whatever you want, so it's cool. <laughs> no, really, it's, it's an honor to kind of meet you i'm looking at your name so i i know I hear oh, it's your nice to meet you too man no no let me let me turn on my video for a minute you'll see why i don't want to be on video wait where i don't even know how to do that just remember some things are larger than they appear no, i'm not going to show that kind of stuff oh. like i usually do <laughs> the rear view the rear view mirror thing right now now we're waiting for the big unveiling yeah this is kind of exciting um, i don't know how to do it 
You want a drum roll or something? Back here, yeah. You're not going to stick around. Um, you know what? It's weird. I don't. If you go to the bottom. It, there should be a little video. Start video. Stop video in the bottom left hand corner. Move your mouse around. Yeah, I see that. And then it says FaceTime HD camera. Yeah. That's it, and it's already checked, but you don't see me. So yeah. I don't know why. Likely story. I don't know. It doesn't seem to work. Yeah. But whatever. It doesn't matter. It's probably because you got it over to your porn site, and it's... Oh, oh there it is. There it's oh, you see me? Scotty! Yeah. Hey! Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, I'm oh, a bit let down. You said you did. Yeah. You're on oh, the room. That's a, it looks like you're in a hotel room. That's I'm saying. in my. I'm just laying in my bed because it's the most comfortable place to be, you know. So you, you guys were wearing that same T-shirt four four months ago. Have you changed? <laughs> What's you, that? You're wearing the same T-shirt as I saw you in four months ago. Well, yeah, I changed it a couple years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That was it. That was the Scotty <laughs> Henderson <laughs> show. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh my god! The yeah. unveiling. Well, well, Peter, I just heard you play with uh, with the trio that you usually play with with uh, Larry Goldings. Yeah, burning man, really nice. Yeah, Bill Stewart. Really, I'm yeah, Bill Stewart. I saw a couple sets. Really nice, man. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. Great band. Thank you, man. Oh, appreciate it. Can Can I introduce the the guest in the show? Sure. Go, go ahead, bitch. <laughs> Peter just, Peter no. Bernstein, welcome to Guitar Wank. Thank you, sir, for traveling all this way from wherever you went to New York. You're in New York where you live. So yeah. that's where'd you go? Downstairs or next door? I went I went a few floors down to my uh my neighbor's studio place. So I'm you know, I can set up my stuff here and play and do whatever. Are you um hmm. you're right in the thick of it. You guys are dealing with the the, the, this crazy pandemic, and um, I bet where, you didn't see you? that coming. <laughs> where, where, where are you? We're in. Well, I'm in. I'm in North Hollywood, Los Angeles. Bruce oh, is in. Well, Carmel Valley. Right. And Scott, where are you, Scott? I'm in L.A. Just you know, like uh, they call it Eagle Rock. It's sort of like in between Glendale and Pasadena. Right. I've heard of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, New York, New York is kind of strangely coming back. To, I mean, not back, but people are kind of, it was really quiet. It was hit really hard just every night. It was brutal, just the news and how, you know, thousand people a day dying from this disease. And it was no joke. People shut down. Everyone, you know, the streets were just deserted. And in the last week or so, the weather's getting nice and people are going stir crazy. There's lots of people on the street, you know. Wow. Uh, bars that are open for takeout. And there people are mingling you know and and it's just kind of like you know people have kind of had it and i guess they feel they're not really at risk or or whatever they just need to socialize and have a beer or you know and just they're just out so Are it's they- a little strange but i mean yeah it's I- the worst thing to be over in terms of the numbers and the, the crazy, uh, the way every every night in the news there'd be like people from from the hospitals and, and the, all the medical people just saying what was going on there, and it was, you know, it was, it was six solid weeks of, you know, just stunned and just being happy to not, you know, you're lucky if you weren't sick or didn't have to go to a hospital. So because it was just every night ambulances and you'd hear. I mean, it was just crazy. Big time. But are they wearing the masks out there, Pete? Most people are. Most yep. people are. I mean, a lot of people that are out mingling and socializing are, are not, you know, so it's a little bit, you know. Well, besides the gigging, this is kind of a guitar player's. It's been over. That's been over for a while. I did one stream gig, and that was kind of strange playing in an empty, empty place. Yeah, how did it feel? In, you, you were in Smalls, right? Yeah, me and Ed Cherry. And that place is usually asshole to elbows all the time, yeah. right? So how did it feel all of a sudden to have nobody in there? I mean... Bizarre. It was just a bizarre thing. You knew people were watching, but, you know, you're just in an empty place and just... Felt strange just to play again. <laughs> you know, so well, that was Peter, 
We forgot to tell you this before when you came on, but since you've done our podcast, you're not going to be getting any phone calls for gigs anymore anyway. That's good. Yeah. So, you know, it's all good now because. I mean, the beginning <laughs> of all this. Your madness, career. The beginning of this madness, that, that joke, you know, that old joke about the old grumpy musician. They say, how's things going? You know, how's the gigs? He said, uh, you know. It was really slow for a while, but now the cancellations are really starting to come in. <laughs> <laughs> it was like hey, I don't know if you even... heard what uh, Joe, the famous line. I mean, I, I'll just make it short. If you haven't heard it, but what John Pisano said when he was on our show, What's that? T- Troy asked him. He says, "Well, you know, you've been in L.A. forever. You've been used to playing seven nights a week. Now you're only doing this Tuesday night guitar night. You know." So how come you're only playing once a week? And 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 he immediately said, "Well, I got to stay home all the other nights in case I get a call." <laughs> That's right. Still sharp at like you know seventy nine years old. Or oh, no, no, he, at that time he was eighty seven. Now he's oh, eighty seven. Wow. He's pushing. Yeah, he's pushing ninety. Yeah. He's yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's. That's beautiful. Yeah. He's still I mean, sharp as a tack, man. He's yeah, so awesome. Yeah. No, it's been a weird, uh, just a weird. Yeah. Comedy with that. How far off are your cancellations? I mean, when's your like next gig on the books? Uh, well, there's some stuff in the fall that hasn't officially been canceled yet, but I'm, I'm sure it will be. I think people are waiting to see what happens. That's in the states. So, and and I have something in Europe then too. I haven't heard if it's canceled. Europe is starting to open, but I don't know how people are. You know, I don't know. I'm sh- these some of these tours. You know. They're so put together with such uh, delicacy that, you know, if you lose three gigs, it's all over. You know, it kind right. of doesn't make sense to go depending on. So I don't know if things are going to fall apart or what and, and how things are looking. But That's where I always am. Because, like, if you've got a tour booked and just two gigs fall out, all of a sudden it's not worth going. Fragile. It's fragile. Yeah. And, you know, I've got, I've got a, a tour booked in October in Asia of all places, right? Mm-hmm. But, but – um, they don't know if it's going to happen, but for me, like I told my agent that I don't think I'm able to make a, like a 13, 14 hour flight wearing a mask. I don't think I can do it. Yeah. That's pretty, that's a long time to fly. Yeah. It's a long time to be wearing a mask where you can't, I I have a hard time breathing. I just can't feel like I'm not getting enough oxygen. And, um, so I sort of feel like I'm not going to be traveling anywhere until this thing is either over or yeah. there's a vaccine or something because I, I don't see myself wearing a mask for that long. It's a tough one. It's well, so they, they kicked hard. off a, 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 a passenger off a plane today because he refused to wear a mask. So, yeah. Uh, on a long flight, Troy, or on a no, short it was a it was a domestic flight within America. So they were like, sorry, dude, get off. But he was a bit of a troublemaker anyway, I believe. Yeah. So, but, you so. know, I have a friend that went to Europe and, and she said, she said that people had their masks on for like the first couple hours and they, everybody took their masks off because they just couldn't deal. Wow. You know, they couldn't eat. I mean, they served the dinner. How are you supposed to eat it? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, I, it's just a weird, you know, I've been going to the grocery store a couple times a week. I mean, I have two kids, so it's like a busy, you know, and getting pet food and stuff. So I'm just like, we, I just, we don't have like a, truck full of stuff we can fill up and be good for months. So I'm just going to the store to get things. And it's just like people are out and they're wearing their masks. And it's like, you kind of just have this new rhythm of like not getting too close to people. This whole, like a whole new, like physical dealing with each other is kind of, kind of settling in. And there's its own code of, of like, you know, you wear a mask, you know, the word is you wear it out of respect to, to your, fellow humans you know because we don't know if we have it so we wear the you know and it's just like a and then i don't know it's just it's a real different different kind of thing but x extra hard for you guys in new york man i mean you guys are yeah because you guys are so crowded together packed in well it's just a weird thing i live i live in this building it's like an artist housing building it's a whole city block there's 300 apartments so you're in elevators every day and just now only one person can ride in the elevator. Wow. Really? Different. Yeah. Well, that's really? what they say because if there's more than three people or two people in elevator, they can't really be six feet apart. So it's now a whole new 
decorum of like, no, you know, you first and everyone <laughs> ride alone in the elevator. But it's a different oh. thing than being, I would think, you know, isolated, but in a house where you have rooms to go to and you go outside and maybe your neighbor's there, but it's not like you leave your house and I have to, you know, because it's like, I might see someone in the hallway. I might be, you know, New York city is just, you're living with people. And it's amazing that it was that it was able to quiet down in terms of the intensity of the disease because people weren't a lot of people left the city, especially this is this is Greenwich Village, so a lot of people are very well healed and they're just out to their one of their other homes, you know. So the city, this this neighborhood feels like fifty percent full, you know, oh, in terms wow. of you know. Mm. But this building where I live, it's a lot of elderly people, so they were very like uh, they shut it down right away. You got to wear your masks. No visitors. You know, you can have deliveries and meet them in the lot. You know, just like they, they realized that this is ba- was kind of like an old folks home. You know, in, st- in terms of statistics, everyone relatively healthy. But so it was right away that you know we felt the uh, okay, this is this is serious. You can't just be, you know, because you're just living among people all the time. Well, how how old are your kids, Pete? Uh, seven and uh, twelve, almost. Wow, 12. are they going nuts or how? Well, they've been okay. I yeah. mean, they did the homeschooling thing, and that's been pretty challenging. My wife did pretty much most of that. She took took the reign of that. I do I do recess, you know, and other you know, lunch, but she's been doing all the, the work and all that, and they're pretty good at it, except you know when they don't feel like doing it, which is probably a lot like going to school <laughs> anyway yeah. you know yeah. I mean, they were pretty good but uh yeah it was it's a challenge and just you know look we can get outside this little you know we can we can go in a, in a courtyard and just kind of walk around the neighborhood and get some air it's not like we've been cooped up all day every day but it's it's a, definitely a lot of you know I, mean, I haven't been home this long in the, ever so i can't you know it's a whole nother reality it just i was of- saying that to bruce bruce and scott i mean all you guys are big touring guys and you play all the time so this has got to be the weirdest thing is like stuck at home all the time the families are got to be what are you doing here all the time so the road is rough and it's tiring especially with traveling and stuff but if uh i mean this is nothing like the fatigue i feel taking <laughs> being with two kids like you know, just like going out, doing this, taking out the garbage, recycling, dishes, you know, this, that, walk the dog, this, you know, more dishes, more laundry. You know, it's just like I'm way more tired than if I would be have been on the road for three months straight. No doubt about it. You know, road is like play the gig. <laughs> Heaven, have a beer. Have a shirt, you know, that's, that's life is simple. It's really not that much to worry about. That's so- right in front. Yeah. Are, you, are you getting more time on the instrument or less? Well, I was, uh, I would say less. I was enjoying practicing a lot and doing, a, you know, online teaching and stuff like that and would try to play as much as possible in the lessons and really enjoying practicing. And then I kind of, a couple weeks ago, got a little bit of, uh, I don't know, it's carpal tunnel. It's some kind of beginning of trigger finger. Oh. I got this thing in my hand. And I, it was just really painful to play for a while. I ended up getting a cortisone shot which cooled it out. But just in the last few days, I'm just kind of starting to be able to play without feeling tingling. So that kind of just shut me down, which is telling me like, anyway, don't worry about practicing, deal with all the other shit you got to deal with. But at the same time, it's painful. And then you're psychologically thinking like, well, what do I, how do I treat this so I can play if, and when there are gigs again, you know? So that was, it kind of took me out of my, uh, any groove I had in terms of practicing and just working through tunes. I was really enjoying playing the guitar and, and just enjoying, I, mean, I know I wasn't working hard, like playing with a you know, happening drummer and hitting and the energy of playing two sets a night or whatever, but I was enjoying playing and I was really enjoying not having the feeling of as much as I love playing of like feeling like I played like shit. <laughs> I feel very often. So I would play and I never didn't have any gigs to like fail on some some somewhere oh boy i can sure relate to that i mean you're playing two sets there's going to be you're playing all these tunes i mean it never goes perfectly it can't it's not possible so you know those things that either you're trying too hard for things you can't play or you're not trying hard enough there's always something to criticize yourself about after a gig so i have to say i was enjoying playing the instrument and not 
having that. You know, <laughs> Peter, when, when you're on the road, do you mainly travel by van or by flights, or or, or is it where. a little bit of both? It depends where. I mean, uh, some. I mean, in the states, it's kind of hard to travel by van because the gigs right, are so far big, apart. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you'll take a couple. You know, a flight a day if you if, you, if it's just one flight and. It's okay. I mean, Europe, you, there's more trains, I think, you know, you get, uh-huh. you get around that way and some vans. It really depends where, where you are and how the tour is put together. But by yeah. the way, I don't want to say say that stuff about to, to sound ungrateful to have gigs. I mean, to be able to play, whether I feel like crap about how I play or not, I'm still happy to have a gig. I'm still grateful that I could do it. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to – and I was really having that, those feelings less – especially on the road, just because I just felt lucky to, to be on the road. Like, man, I'm, they're paying for, our, you know, to come there and play and people show up and it's just a miracle. You know, it's, it's more of a miracle now. I didn't, not that I took it for granted when I was younger, but it was just like, everybody's doing it. And now I can get in there and do it sometimes. And that's great. Now I was realizing what a incredible freakish, you know, thing that is to have like this little society in some little town in Germany or whatever and they just have a, a gig there because of one crazy nut who's just like I'm gonna have music in this town of you know and that's how the gigs are and then people show up and they go to all the gigs that come through and it's just like man thank God for you know and that's why kind of I'm hopeful with this pandemic because I think that jazz is too small to fail really I think that <laughs> it's gonna suffer for sure there'll be things that can't happen that used to happen and Bigger festivals will lose all, you know, but I think that the grassroots of it, people will keep it going because it was barely hanging on before. And that, and that's, that's how I feel. It's just, it's really too small to fail. Somebody will, will pick up. So it's so pretty much what I got from that Pete was it's like the cockroach of music. Like it will never die. (laughs) Yes. Well, you know, yeah. And whenever when someone sees you, they try to kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. And we shut down a lot more clubs than we've shut down as many clubs as cockroaches too, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, Peter, you said something. You said something that was actually the opposite of how I feel because you said that being on the road is easier for you than being at home, and I find the opposite because I'm having to fly a lot. I guess, right. you know, that's and I'm so- seeing much less. <laughs> van gigs and a lot more flight gigs so yeah. you know how it is when you have to take a flight and play the same night oh. where you feel like you know you just did the airline person's job and then but they get to rest when they get there but you have to work <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt flying is exhausting so flying is that's what makes me the most not missing touring and, is flying. And airport just dealing with airports. Yeah, just dealing know. with airports and dealing with all the shit. Are you going to get your guitar on the plane? And then standing in all the lines to to go through, you know, to check in, to go through security, to go yeah. through the visa thing. And and by the time you finish with all that stuff, now it's time for sound check. And oh. Yeah. You know that's that's really hard, and that's and and plus sleeping in a bed every a different bed every night is hard on my back. So oh, yeah, that's true. In that way, for me, the road is harder. But then again, you know, I don't have to do the dishes every night like I do here. So that's the one. <laughs> and you don't have two little kids. You just got one. That's you know, right. I've got one sixteen-year-old, and she's watching Breaking Bad. So we're having fun, you know. So you did. So, you did the work. Well, I would say, I mean, I'd say for me, it's my wife, you know, I mean, like I call this, everybody's calling it the pandemic for her. It's the mandemic, you know, because basically, you know, I've been on the road or out working all the time. And right. like now I have been home for four months straight, you know, day and night. And she doesn't know who's this guy, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, can't, luckily I have this little bunker I've built out behind our house Right. called the, the bebop bunker and it's uh it's where i you know basically get away from her so she can survive the pandemic you know <laughs> i love it so pete are you are you a new new yorker by choice yeah. or no born and raised born and raised in the island of manhattan actually yeah wow so when when did you like if we could go back when did you start with the guitar and and what was a little bit of your journey so some of our listeners could well I I started uh, 
piano was my first instrument. I picked, I uh, started play. I was really into like ragtime music when I was maybe nine or ten or something, because that was the time when the, the Sting came out, the movie, and so I, you know everyone was trying to play the Entertainer. I really liked ragtime. Besides just that one song, the Entertainer, I was kind of trying to play the ragtime piano when I was little, and then a few years later, I got into the guitar. I saw some guys playing the guitar at, at high, at, in school. I was a junior high school, and they were older kids playing the guitar. It looked like so, so much fun. So I got into the guitar and just checking out blues and and rock. Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. That was that. That was it. And then I went back to the blues and got into jazz from from the from from the blues guys and just how it all fit together. And then the rest of jazz, like the non guitar part of of that of that world. And I was about 15, 16. I think at 15, I got to study with Attila Zoller. I got to, he had this camp in Vermont, uh, jazz camp. And I went up there one summer and uh, just for, for like five days or so. And I was the only guitar player there. It was just Attila and me and Don Friedman and two piano players that were Don Friedman students. That was the whole thing. And some neighbors came over the and they had some a bass player and drummer came over the end kind of get the jam but it was just hanging out with Attila for a week and that's when I really got into I mean I was into it before but just studying with him and really playing every day and that was you know changing your direction of life hello <laughs> Thank you, the kid, the yeah so that was in. that was it yeah, man. You know, and you were didn't you grow you you were kind of in a pot of cats though, right? Like, didn't you know Larry Goldings when you were really well, young? I met him the next summer after I was got to study with Attila. I, I went to the Eastman Summer Jazz Camp, and that was the uh, summer of '84, I guess, because I was going to go into twelfth grade or no, eleventh grade, I think, between tenth and eleventh grade. And uh, Larry was a year younger, and it was a bunch of musicians I met that summer, and that was my first time really being around other cats and trying to play with people. <laughs> I mean, I was pretty, you know, pretty green about that. And and what was, about Anton? Did you grow up around Anton him? Anton was there. He was there at Eastman. Joey Cavastino, this incredible alto player who played just like Johnny Hodges and was like an Ellington scholar. And yeah. then he got into, he played with Illinois Jaquette, lead alto with Illinois Jaquette. And then he got into like hip hop and, and producing. So he kind of has both worlds going, but he taught me so much about music, listening to just all these records, Ellington and everything. Uh, and Larry was kind of already, yeah. smoking. you know, he could already play. He was 15. I was 16. So it must've been between 11th and 12th grade. So that was the summer that really like, you know, and it was like four weeks and we got to play with in a big band and small groups. And I met Gene Bertensini that summer. He was the teacher there. So uh, he really was so great and, you know, continues to be yeah. great, great guy. But so that was it. And then I was lucky enough to get to go to school to study jazz. And I mean, I went to Rutgers at first. I was there for a year and studied with Ted Dunbar. I just kind of bounced around some different schools and, uh, Went to William Patterson College. That's where I met Bill Stewart and Joe Farnsworth and people like that were there. Jesse Davis. So I was lucky to, and not didn't look good on my college record, but I was going to like I went to three different schools, and bouncing around just got me meeting more people and getting more into the thing of, uh, you know, just playing with people and that whole social aspect of uh, music. Definitely. Yeah. A Growing up in New York, definitely a great place to be for yeah. for jazz, yeah. right? Right. About social undistancing with music, <laughs> you know, like it. Social undistancing, really? Yeah, yeah. Non-distancing, not non-social. Right. right. Yeah. The social distancing with jazz, it just means the audience stays far away from us <laughs> <laughs> altogether. Yeah. <laughs> they stay away altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I first heard I think I first heard Bruce live at Cork Festival. Might have been in the nineties. Oh right. That's the first time we hung, right. Yeah. You were playing with Jack uh who was the trumpet player? Bill Barry. Bill Barry. Yeah, the guy from Ellington's band. Yeah. yeah Bill Barry. Yep, that was amazing. He was real he was a real deal old school guy, man. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and that that was the first time I got. But I knew knew you from records before that. But that was the first time. That was maybe ninety four or something like that. Right. That was like when Brad was there. Brad yeah, Melville before he was blown up. You know, like he was just kind of. I think he was Perico's piano player, right? Right, Perico Sambiat. Yeah. 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 yeah that was a fun, yeah, was a cool hang we had there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So and. Have you come out to? You've come out to LA and played a bunch out here. So, yeah, uh, over the years, I mean, I used to come out to the Jazz Bakery when they were doing weeks. You know, it was out, it was in Culver City, and the first time I went out there, I think, was with uh, Melvin Ryan actually, and uh, Killer Ray Appleton had a band. Uh, we did a week out there, and uh, then I used to come with Larry and and Bill because well, Larry moved out there in two thousand and one. So uh, since then, we've been coming out every year. And after the bakery uh, stopped happening, we played at Vitello's a few times. Yeah, yeah. It would give us like a, like a weekend or something. It was a lot of fun. And uh, once at, uh, what's the place? Vibrato. Once, only one time we played, we made that game. Oh, that's, oh yeah. But, uh, and then it was uh, the Blue Whale lately. You know, we've been out there a few times, so. God, I wonder what all this shit's going to look like after, all, you know, all is said and done. You know, how many are going to be able to hold on, you know? Right. right. Well, I it's wonder what they're so the sad. You know, I mean, it's just so sad. You know, these people, yeah. they, they were trying their hardest to keep a business going. Yeah. Let's face it. Everybody's talking about they wanted to go back to March 12th, you know, like. But I remember March 12th and it wasn't so popping even then. You know, I mean, we were not like on a, you know, a big wasn't like the Roaring Twenties, you no. know. And uh, it just, you know, I hope they can hang on or, you know, or whatever. We have to figure out what's going to be the next thing for this. Because it's, whether we like it or not, man, these months are changing people. That's true. You know, I mean, we can't, we can't assume that, oh, oh, we had a few bad months. Now we're just going to go back. You know, I mean, just like those guys that went off to World War II, you know what I mean? When they came home. It was a whole different world when they got back. You sure. know? And the yeah. thing about the, the arts, maybe that when in, in the past, people would be home and the, there were, you couldn't go to movies, you couldn't go. I mean, nothing happened. Right. But uh, they didn't have the Internet. So now people are just like it's a different generation. Now people are already like here all the time to even you know, get enough of those people aware and going out and, and thinking that it's a thing to keep, uh, like you say, like those kind of businesses, you know, happening. People might, like you say, it, it's true. They could just be like, well, they, people don't do that anymore. You right. Know? Well, man, and it's gone. It's, it's gone. not a thing. You want to see music, get on your, get on the internet and look on who's, look at someone's YouTube channel. You know what I mean? Like that might be more of a thing, but I don't know the people that are attracted to the music after if they know the difference they'll they'll want to they'll have had I mean I, I see your point but they'll have had so many months of just looking at a screen that just going and hearing an instrument live in the same room might freak people out to the point where it like hey this is cool this is we haven't had this in a while even though it was kind of there <laughs> all along I mean Maybe that's a good point. I, so. I, I, just so. argued, I just argued the complete opposite points of, of you. Like oh, no, I hope so. I know I'll be the guy that'll be there. I mean, I will. You know me. I'm always hanging out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm. That's what I do. You know, I mean, if I'm playing to gig one thing, but if I'm not, I'm out hanging. You know, because a because I love it, and b I want to support the scene. You know, there's two reasons to do it, and. Um, but I just worry that, you know, as as, right. as as the as the world sort of gets sucked into the box. Yeah. And we as artists, in order to maintain connectivity with our communities, have to be in the box, too. Right. That's right. You know, that, that, that when we get through this thing, you know, we're, people are going to be looking at obviously the, the economic problems of whatever this did to the world, including the clubs having to charge more money or or right. rearrange something. If they can only have half the amount of people in there that they used to be able to have, then they got to charge twice as much. Right. You know, and now people have been getting it for free for months, you know, and, and a, you know, your beer at home costs one thing, but a beer in a club costs another. I mean, New York it, is probably the most primed to do well 
because in a way it's it's like it's like a theme park. I mean, if but you only if the tourists come back. Right. If you that's go to New York, it's a Broadway show and a jazz club. I mean, that's how you do New York. When you go to L.A., jazz, you know, it's Disneyland and, and you know, and the Walk of Fame, you know, in Hollywood. You don't right. – the jazz club really isn't on the L.A. to-do list. That's true. You know, so New York will, will probably fare the best, in my opinion, if the tourists come back. And if we – if we can all get back to hanging out close to each other, because I think the longest this goes, it's what, it's what worries me, you know? Yeah, you're, right. you're absolutely right. The longer it goes, the harder. But if, it, if, it's, if it's another six months or a year before things really feel like they're coming back a little bit, that, it's not that long in the big scheme of things. And, I mean, considering, like, what, in, in London, was that for f three years people had to, you know, they were living their lives, and at night, every time they heard sirens, they had to go under into the bunkers. Yeah. Nobody was making plans. There was no, I mean, that shut down every facet of life. They're under, they're in war and they were had to deal with rationing. They had to deal, I mean, people are now like, we're just bored now. That, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> and we've got the internet. We got the whole world on a screen the and we're bored. there. You're right. You're right. It could really be people get used to that and, and it just changes. Yeah. You know? I think the, um, the older generation and generations of the past are probably laughing their asses off hell. Oh, how sad you guys have got it. Wow, you got to sit on your couch and you got this right. internet that you can do everything on and you can work yeah. from home. And But, you know, it, everything's relevant, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really deep. It's really incredible time, that's for sure. So yeah. are, you, are you teaching a lot, Pete? Yeah, I've totally reversed my uh, no online lesson policy. <laughs> <laughs> Total one eight. That too, that. Man. I'm there right with you. Like <laughs> we all did that, right? We used we used online to promote offline. That was what it was all about, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and, but as soon as March 13th happened, we all dove into the pool if we were smart, you know, right. because it was the only the only line. It was There's the no only pool line. left. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> but I mean, it was it's the only way to 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 make any money was to do do lessons online. I mean, I used to not do it just because it was like I did, I had enough students through a couple of schools that I would teach at and just people coming through New York. It's not like people had to, you know, whatever. I mean, if people, New York was already a destination. So if somebody from some place would say, you do an online lesson, I would say, come to New York, see a Broadway show too. You know, go see the, go to see the Yankees. You know, it's a great city. I would try to do my part for tourism and when you're here, let's get together, and I would and I would be happy to do it. But there's none of that now. Yeah, you're so like, don't come to New York, stay at home. Well, <laughs> nope, nobody's doing it. Yeah, you know, nobody's doing it. I heard. Um, or I mean, I feel super lucky. I mean, I know I have some great player friends who just haven't gotten into the teaching thing. They just don't really do it. They just don't really teach. They're not known as teachers, and people, you know. Anytime people would express interest in studying with them, they would kind of put them, you know, they just have kind of, they don't do it. And, and they have no way. One of them, great bass player, just moved out of town. He had a chance to live in another town next to his sister. Where he just took his family. And I don't blame him because how is he making any money here now? There's no, there's no way. So. And the rents didn't go down. No. You know, I mean. Not going down. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, but it's like. And, you know, I mean, that was like the generation just before me. You know, I mean, the cats didn't want to teach. Right. It was like, they. I mean, when I wanted to learn stuff, it was all figure it out. That's what I did. You know, I mean, it yeah. was, you know, no one was really, there were some guys that were really cool with, would want to hang and work shit out with you, you know. But a lot of, you know, it was really a more pervasive attitude of like, hey, figure it out yourself. I did. You know, you got records. You come to gigs. You know, it's, there's nothing I can show you. You know, it's all right, right there for you. Um, right. And then, you know, I was kind of almost that first generation that swift flipped that paradigm where, you know, it was just cool to talk about the shit and share it with people. And it was a great way to make some extra money. And, you know, and if you want to learn something, try teaching it. That's a good way to learn it. You know what I mean? It really makes you rethink about, rethink how it all works. Yeah, absolutely. And so that, and that sort of changed the world. And there's a lot of guys, like you say, yeah, that I really worry. And we're losing some really big talents at the end of their career right. who are just kind of 
they're just disconnected. A because they're old, they're older. You know, the older we are, the more the, the net is less our friend. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. They're more tech challenge. They don't want to teach, and so the, you know, you got guys sitting around who are just like national treasures. Some of the best resources this culture has to offer, and they're just like wasting away. You know, yeah. in my opinion, you're absolutely right. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, and it was pretty devastating how a lot of that generation was leaving us anyway, even when there was some semblance of a scene. I mean, this is, you know, people that are that are born in the 30s and certainly in the 20s, they're, you know. Yeah. They're checking. They're, they come on, they're going on. So this is a whole new, uh, a whole new paradigm. And the young people, as always, you know, deal with it because i mean people are going to be creative no one's going to stop making stop people making music it'll just be other other methods and the whole thing it's just scary because the whole thing that we've been talking about is like play with people listen to the person around you blend with your you know like you know you're a live organism you know and play with other you know and just that's like that's not how it's music is made anymore so it's just like okay i don't know well yeah, even more so what you guys grew up with and went through, man, that's just going to all just, yeah, it's not yeah. going to exist for yeah. maybe a long time, if any. I wonder, I wonder. It's like when they stopped using whale oil for lamps, you know, it's like all, <laughs> all those people like, like whalers, you know, they're just like, you don't want to find yourself a whaler because first of all, you know, killing whales is a shitty thing to do, but that was, that was their gig you know they're like no we don't need you anymore we don't need you to kill the whales you basically killed all the whales anyway and luckily now we have a light bulb so thanks so now you're like well what do you do you can make some knots you like are good on a boat you know like what do you what's what is your skill set that's going to make you like you know have a life now that you uh you know yeah but we on, on the other side you know and again i find my i mean just like you mentioned earlier i find myself almost arguing with myself all day long. You know what I mean? Because I go from one side of the argument to the other. I mean, we're jazz musicians. Our thing is to create in a given, you give me a set of changes and my job is to use my imagination and be aware of the surroundings and make something happen. Right. You know? So, I mean, if the changes are no gigs, deal with it on your own, you got the internet, those are the changes I've got. Now, if I'm really, if I'm going to embrace what it, it means to be a jazz musician right. in the true lineage of all the guys that came along, it's up to me to play the changes. You That's know what right. I mean? Just like a whaler has to realize, okay, no more whaling. I got to play these changes now. This is a yeah. hard tune, but I got to figure out what to do. Yeah. What can I harpoon next? <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know? Seals. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. That's Weird. sort of what my playing sounds like sometimes, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Pete, did you, did like, when you were uh, coming up to the scene, were you looking at trying to get on tours and stuff like that? Was that a big thing when you were coming up or not? I mean, sure. I mean, just playing gigs at all was, was the thing. I mean... Yeah, there was a, there were a lot of clubs around when I was you know coming of of age, a lot and it was always was, jazz based, right? I mean, when I got into yeah, being trying to study and be on the scene, it was that scene, like you know, I you know just the, the jazz clubs, Bradleys. There were different types of clubs. You could see different types of, of gigs. There were a lot more casual gigs where a piano player and a bass player would just play every night for a week at Bradleys. You know, Kenny Barron, Ray Drummond, people like that. I remember Ray Drummond told me they would try to play a week, three sets a night, six nights, and not repeat a tune. You know? Wow. There were those types of gigs that you could go see. And uh, and then there were also bands. There was, you know, bigger venues. I, I caught a lot of groups at the bottom line, like like uh, John McLaughlin and different things there. And who else did I see at the bottom line? I saw a lot of good stuff, like Billy Cobham's band and different different types of groups, which were more, you know... Uh, I saw a weather report at the Beacon Theater. I mean, I would see other things that were more concert-like, Pat Metheny group, bunch. But really, I, I gravitated towards the club scene and going to the, you know, 
going to the Vanguard and going to Sweet Basil and all these places were weeks. They had week long gigs. And uh, except some place like Visiones would give you a couple nights or a weekend, but Visiones was a smaller club for like kind of place where you know you'd have the heavy cats, but then you also had some young punk. So that was kind of our our inn, a place like Visiones, the Village Gate. The upstairs part, not the upstairs, but the street level part. The upstairs yeah. part had theater and comedy and some gigs. I remember seeing Art Blakey there. And then the downstairs was the bigger room, and I saw lots of stuff in there, too. Uh, they had Latin jazz night there and, and all this stuff. But they started having gigs on the, on the street level, the terrace part. And that was the first place I played a week with Jimmy Cobb and, and Brad. And we were kind of just, just out of school. And uh, so... That was kind of the beginning of the, like, yeah, that's the best kind of gig is a week long gig because you just can settle in and get comfortable and just play every night and feel like, you know, you're going to work, you know. I remember yeah. the first time I got to play the Village Vanguard with Lou Donaldson. I just had that feeling like, wow, I have like a job for this week. I have a real job and I feel like, you know, a member of the community, you know, of other types of workers. My job is to go to the Vanguard and play, to, I mean, get my ass kicked every night of course with Lonnie Smith and Lou Donaldson like hitting every night boom you know every, you know everything they played was so I was just flailing away but I felt like wow this is what it's about the end of the week on, on Monday you pick up your guitar and wow I feel different I feel older you know just that, that experience playing every night three sets on Friday and Saturday and uh that's how you got that's the only way you could really feel yourself getting better was by doing it there i mean not shedding only yeah wow that just seems like such a different time i'm really feeling for the for the young people coming up now like they're thinking like this is what they want to do and now where are they going to do it you know at least they're looking to us like at least you got to do it you know yeah it's true i mean and they're all playing it's amazing they're all playing so good too they're playing so good but it's like they're, you know, I mean, the poor guy, I mean, how do they do it without experience? You know, I mean, you know, and especially experience with uh, the older cats, you know, the the real, you know, standard bearers of the music, you know. Um, but yet uh, somehow I'm sure and I'm sure that will change the sound of the music as well. You know, ultimately, that will have a big effect on. on yeah, what I mean, I'm, I've already was already seeing a difference in terms of younger guys getting a band together, like trying to get a more, not like Weather Report or anything like that, but they were trying to get a band like that, but even not as loose as Weather Report, like more like they have their tunes and they're kind of working on their thing and they, less kinds of gigs. There's no place for a young piano player to go see, you know, Hank Jones playing every night or Jimmy Rolls or, or Tommy Flanagan or Kenny Barron or Barry Harris or the, you know, and just playing tunes. So that was just, it's not, I'm, I saw the things changing before as that's not as much of a model for people, you know, right. they got into it and saw some, you know, they, they still want to swing, but it's a different kind of different kind of thing in terms of the types of, of things people are putting together. There just weren't as many casual gigs, you know, you might get a chance to play right. in smalls and then that's like, you know, if you're a young cat coming up, you get to play at smalls or someplace like that. And you got your night like once, you know, once a year or something or once you know if, you, if you're in the rotation it's once every six months or something like that and that's like so they come with their with their program they want to hit and play their their stuff it's not just kind of like the more casual play with the old cats and learn some tunes on on the gig you know right, it. right. and those cats and came up playing so much i mean yeah like i say i was at the tail end of that i mean we're talking five sets a night yeah you know five nights a week and you would go out afterwards and go sit in somewhere you know or you'd go somewhere before and play i mean yeah. and, and everybody was it was this real incestuous scene where everybody was playing with everybody you know the whole idea of one guy playing with just their yeah. band that only happened for a little tour that would happen and then you'd be back in the pool and everybody'd be like mixing it up again you know no wonder you fuckers got so good different oh, got so crazy. it's a different parent it's a, just a different setting so different like yeah. Pete since you were a younger guy in New York did you see just the situation the scene in New York change over the last 
so many years? Like you saw a lot of big changes for the better or for the worse in New York or? Well, I mean, yeah, if you're thinking about all the, the great people that I got to see, it's changing for the worse. Of course, a young drummer who moved to New York City in two, the year 2000 even, never got to see Art Blakey or Billy Higgins. Maybe, when did Elvin pass? You know, but I got to see all these incredible drummers. Roy Haynes is still with us. Jimmy Cobb was, was here, and, you know, until recently. And, you know, there's great, great people. Too. He, I'm just, just thinking of drummers for some reason, but it's just like, I saw so many great people that now I don't only just know them from records like these people do. Right. And these people are now 40. <laughs> like they already like they were born in 1980, so they missed a bunch of stuff. They didn't get to New York till 2000 and, you know, 8 or something like that or whatever or even if, you know, even in the early 2000s it was it was yeah. changed. So, but that's just it doesn't make it less good. It just it just, you know, it's just the sense of this connection to the past, but I think there's still great players coming through New York, always have been, and it's always been that way. Just what I've observed is there's fewer gigs and fewer casual gigs where people just kind of learn to, you know, like Bruce was saying, mix it up. I just, right. Was you know, it, there a I don't need to know tunes because they don't play them. You right. know? How can they? They play the tunes they want to play, and then that's it. That's cool. That's yeah. fine, too, you know. Yeah. But so, I, I mean, I can lament for those days and think how lucky I have to have, I, I've been to see all those people, but that just, you know, that just happens, you know. I mean, people are, people are still, still a strong scene, and more students than ever, more people into it, younger people than I can see. Maybe they just seem younger you know they're they're you know they are you're getting older and they are younger they're all the more the older you get the more people are younger than <laughs> yeah. yeah i know and you know and you're right i mean it's like and the things but that's kind of a beautiful thing and the things you value are things that you know you you value because that's a part of who you are and um and new people come up and Part of their job is to kind of reject your values and create their own. That's part of a right. young person's thing. And the other, you know, and, 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 you know, and yeah. And, and so we just have to kind of, it's a, that's a rough sandwich that I remember like the older cats when I was coming up, you know, watching them yeah. go through this whole, they were transitioning into the older cats, you know, yeah. and it's not a graceful thing a lot of times. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, and I had this one mentor, he, you know, he was hung out with Bird. He was kid friends with Bird. Wow. And he remembers everybody hating Bird. You know, wow. like that they all hated what Bird was doing. They, like the swing cats hated what Bird was doing to jazz, you know, making it, making it so much in a different, you know, taking it in a different way. And, yeah. you know, and his, all, his always thing was like, yeah, they're just pissed off because they, they realize they need to go home and practice. You know, but that, you know, but that was from his point of view because he was in that generation. Right. Right. Whereas, you know, those older cats, you know, they thought that music was going to ruin jazz. And people weren't going to like it. And, you know, they were going to lose their, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it wasn't melodic and, it, you know, it, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, I, I definitely am conscious of that. And I, in the sense that uh, I don't ever want to start a sentence with young cats need to. Yeah, I don't, right. I don't, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to be that guy because basically, young cats are just like we were when we were younger. I mean, they're just right. like it's just like they're young cats, and they don't, you know, some want to be lectured to, and some don't. Just like from our generation, some did, and some and some didn't. And you know, I just, I just don't because it's, it's uh, everyone's got to do their thing, and, and that's the point. You find yourself. You don't. You can't do it. You know, because someone else did it. That's not. But you mean we see the same thing. I mean, it's just a different kind of person, right? You know, I mean, you see it with with teachers now, even in uh, in jazz education. Uh, is like there are some guys that are so invested in their own thing that they almost take it as a personal affront when their student is into somebody else. You know, a different style. You know, like you're my private student, and yet you're digging on xyz guy you know and like for them 
it's like an insult. Right. You know, and it's like, no, man, you know, we need to realize that, no, it's like, we're not, we're not here sharing this information to validate who we are. Yeah. We're here to share this information so that they can go and do with it what they want. Right. Exactly. I mean, cause that's no one, you know, even though the cats were t- always telling us what to do, we really did what we want. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm looking for a student to, to validate me and not to feel like an old corny motherfucker. Like, that's what I, <laughs> I'm looking for that. They can be into whatever they're into. I just don't want to be perceived as corny. If, if, if they perceive me as corny, that's my fault. It's not their fault. I can't be mad at them. So it's just like. I you, you can't be, you can't validate yourself through the eyes of somebody else. You know, you, no, you got to do that. I, I'm <laughs> validating it just in, in the absence of being labeled a, uh, you know what I mean? I don't. I, I just want because they're younger, so I'm conscious of of what they see. So I'm not looking to. to I mean, I know it's taste is taste, but I I am conscious that I don't want to just like say this is what this is what you got to do because I just want to show what I am, and if they dig it, then I can do the best I can to help them to show them what I think about. But it's not a personal thing as much as it is the. A stylist, stylistic thing is the, the personal thing of like I want you to be into the stuff that I care about, you know, phrasing and playing the sweet notes and making decisions about what you want to play. I don't want you to make the same decisions as me. That's going to make me feel weird. I want you to, you know, that's the point of teaching is to watch someone. Hey, they're making their own decisions. That's all I can say is that's just do that and trust your decisions. Learn to trust. Your musical instincts. Learn to call them on their bullshit. And to call them on their bullshit. But exactly, exactly. But you, you know, or set it up where they see themselves that, oh, this is what I'm not thinking about. You know, that's all. Every great teacher for me got me thinking about what I was doing, as if they somehow got their voice inside my head, and without in a zen way, they just asked me to ask myself, am I sure I want to do that? You know what I mean? Like that's that's just like that's my is that the best I can come up with right now? Like they're you know, they made me think about what I was doing. Not to think about what they would do, right. except if I just wanted to steal something we're outright. But the point is that a teacher makes you think about what is this am I doing this thoroughly? Am I doing this with with attention and care and and love and the and the ultimate expression to I mean the ultimate desire to express myself, not express what I think the teacher would want me to play. But yeah, well, you know, I mean, they they come to us for answers, but really, our job is to make them ask questions. Exactly, exactly. That's right. That's good. Pete, like what, Pete, what what was some that. what was some of the New York etiquette or some of the hard lessons you had to learn with the gigging lifestyle in New York that maybe doesn't happen to other places? Was there kind of some stories that you had you learned some hard hard well, lessons? Well, I mean, just I mean, just the, the the gig I alluded to before about playing with with Lou Donaldson and Lonnie Smith, just people that were so consistently themselves, so you know, talk about courage of conviction. Like they, everything they played was, was them. Even when, even when Papa Lou would play Charlie Parker solo, it was still Lou just like quoting Charlie Parker as if he could have been quoting Shakespeare or whatever. He was quoting Charlie Parker. It was, but it was still in his being. And and just to be around people that were like larger than life characters in just that kind of charisma. You know, so that was the lesson of just like, oh, that's what it's about. Not trying to play, you know, the licks from the record or anything like that. They're musical entities. You know, they're like, you know, they're characters. That's, you know what I mean? And so that was, that was being in New York was being around all those characters, personalities, like just seeing Jackie Byard play and just like what the humanity that came from those people, just like, Besides all the stuff they could teach you about music, just how they inhabited their music, how they how the instrument disappeared, you know, and and just seeing that kind of intensity and mastery. But basically, it wasn't just the musical mastery; it was just like the mastery of just like this is this is my stuff. This is me. I'm playing my stuff. 